<laughs> well, thank you all for being here today. It's uh, quite a blessing to see your lovely faces. Uh, so good to see you again, Brother John. I thought you were back in Billings, but it's a delight to see you here again with us today. And uh, I want to uh, tell you that on Father's Day, we're going to have a special Father's Day service. The service will be at 11. We haven't yet put it in the bulletin. I'll give the information to our brother, Sean Alexander, to put in the bulletin for us. But we're joining with the Church of the Good Shepherd on Father's Day to have a very special Father's Day service. So come, bring a friend, bring a dad, and we're going to have a wonderful and delightful luncheon afterward. So I invite you to that. I also invite you to pray for a couple of uh, my friends. I, I asked a friend yesterday, I was at a conference Thursday, Friday, and yesterday, and I said, is everybody under attack? And I, before she could answer, because she just looked and I said, just say no, not everyone. And she was obedient and said, no, not everyone. And I said, praise God. But at, during the conference, one of my friends uh, missed the chair and hit the floor. During the conference, one of my friend's mother died. Pastor Aubrey's wife, Lisa, Pastor Aubrey at Abundant Life, his mother-in-law died. And then during the conference, I learned that a very good friend of mine has lupus. Her name is Sharon. She sings like an angel. If you were here a couple Easter's ago, she sang for us here at City Church. Pray for her. Pray for uh, First Lady Lisa Fenton, whose mother died. And um, for my friend, Dr. Granham, who missed the chair and hit the floor. So, uh, and, and Dr. Eve was there and she was doing well. And we made sure we kept the information from her about her daughter-in-law's mother until she was able to leave. And getting her out of the building was hard, but uh, we were successful when she heard the news later. So pray for her and Apostle Fenton, the Fentons and the Granums, and my friend Sharon. I ask the Holy Spirit to remind them to pray. So some of you probably will know this song. If we can get the words up on the screen behind me, I'm going to ask you to sing with me because I'm sure that this song is your testimony too, that you can sing the words of these songs, uh, uh, sing the words of this song. I have uh, my spiritual mom asked me maybe 30 years ago or more, a lot happened to me 30 years ago that are still sticking with me today. She says, I have a song I want you to sing, uh, but you have to tell me if you can sing it. She was not asking me if I had the capability of belting out the chords and the notes and all of that. She was asking me, could I embrace the message and sing it? And for me, that's what a song is about, me being able to embrace the message of that song and then to be able to sing it as well. So sing along with me if you know it. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name 
and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours. And you are mine, your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed. And you won't start now. So I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours. And you are mine, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. So I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the way. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. I am yours, and you are mine. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Is that your testimony too? I know it is mine. From the first when I heard the song, I said, oh yes, I can relate to that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Bless the writer of that song and the one who sang it and brought it to us. Hallelujah. So that we could sing it too. I want us to look in... 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That's where our text comes from today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And what we have read today in our responsive reading and what Sister Stacy brought to us in that additional reading and and how Brother Sean Alexander put it on the front of our bulletin as well. All of these things that we have heard today and from John 15, all of these things go together with the songs that we have sung and they're all a part of the message that God has sent to us today, including this message that I bring to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
I will say to you that the Lord sent me into my archives to pull this message out. It is not the first time that I have preached this message. I preached this message to a group of ministers at the seminary many years ago, many years ago. And I thought that I was going to continue on the gifts that God gives us as I had started last week. And I just did not, and I was ready to go there uh, because when I leave here, it's on Mondays that as I was taught in, in seminary on Monday, you begin to uh, discern from the Lord what the message is for the coming Sunday because if you're preaching every Sunday you you have to start somewhere for the next Sunday and and that's how I, I was taught but then as I got home from the conference yesterday and um, I began to move in the direction that I thought I was supposed to go to continue from last week I felt the uneasiness in my spirit that sent me searching and I went from here to there and I'm reading and I'm like tomorrow is the day Lord you know and uh, he brought me to this passage that I would bring to you uh, when I say to you a group of ministers uh, because today I'm looking at the same a group of people that God has called to do ministry that he is making his appeal through you to the world so that the world would be reconciled to him but I, I bring this message and I hope that you are patient with me today that we might be a little longer than I have been trying to be recently as you might have noticed that I try to bring a shorter message but uh, this might take a little longer so I hope that uh, whatever you've got on the stove is already turned off and if you've cooking anything that it's in a crock pot so you don't have to worry about it but I was so impressed to bring this message to you it's called fade cream can't touch this I don't know if you gentlemen know what fade cream is but as we go along, you'll know. Sometimes we get a mark on our skin and we use certain creams to remove it. Now, maybe you gentlemen may not be in that category, but we women, we understand this clearly. And so I remember when I was a little girl, I played kind of rough. I mean, you look at me today and you say, oh, how, whatever it is that you say. But when I was a girl, I was kind of rough. I climbed trees. I climbed the roof behind our house, which was a garage. I climbed that roof and uh, I played football and dodgeball and I played monkey in the middle, hopscotch, wall ball, Chinese jumping rope. I rode a bike and I rode skates behind my mother's back because I broke my leg when I was three and she never allowed me to skate again, but I did so behind her back. Don't tell her. Well, she's in heaven. I played jacks. I had tea parties. I played with dolls. But it was not for these three that my mother greased me up with cocoa butter. It wasn't for the jacks and it wasn't for the doll playing or the tea parties. It was for all this other stuff that she put cocoa butter on me because cocoa butter is supposed to remove scars, okay? It was for all those other things and as a result, my skin stayed pretty clear throughout most of my life. Then when I got older, the things that left marks on me was burning myself with a curling iron. I mean, you gentlemen might see your wife using a curling iron. Well, you know, you kind of miss sometime, then you get burned. Burning myself uh, cooking or getting cuts or various scrapes during the cooking process. Kneeling in prayer is going to put dark marks on your knees. Okay, so for these, I use the big girl scum. That big girl stuff like Artra Skin Tone Cream or Esoterica or Mary Kay Even Complexion Essence. And I found that some marks were more stubborn to fade than others. 
Some took several weeks, others took months, and still others took years. But in time, they all faded, but some did not. There are some scars that you have, that you still have. I remember I have a scar, which hand? It would be this hand, it looks like a, a wishbone from a chicken that I got hitting the window when my sister locked me out and I hit it a little too hard and cut my wrist. That is still there as a reminder to me. Now, there is a skin condition called melasma that over-the-counter fade creams can't touch it. It doesn't even budge with those creams, but the doctor can prescribe something for you that will cause it to fade from your complexion. And in this life, lest you think I'm going to talk about skin all this time, I'm going to talk about another skin. In this life, there are some marks that you get and there is no fade cream that can even touch them. There are marks that you get just by virtue of you being in relationship with other folk. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There are marks that you get serving folk. There are marks that you get trying to help folk, trying to save folk, trying to direct and counsel folk. Hmm. Trying to mentor people. Anybody ever mentor anybody? I think when it comes to dealing with the marks in life that no fade cream can touch, the Apostle Paul is our master teacher, which takes us to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Starting in verse 3, this is what he says. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Are you with me? In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. As deceivers, yet true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. As chastened and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. That, that, that's a lot for the ministry, wouldn't you say? Some of you might want to get up now and say, hey, I'm not so sure I want to be this minister if I've got to be experiencing all of these things. You see, what is Paul saying to us? What is Paul saying to a people who say, I want to be like Jesus? He's saying that first and foremost, we want to defend the ministry that God has given us at all cost and demonstrate that we are truly servants of the Most High God. That's the first thing he's saying. He's saying that in this life of ministry, we will be wounded because of someone else's transgression. Does it sound familiar to you from Isaiah 53? He was, brute, he was wounded for our transgressions. And so he is letting us know that we will be bruised because of someone else's iniquity, that the chastisement that brings someone else peace is going to fall on us and that it is going to be by the stripes that are laid upon us, by the stripes that we bear in our bodies, the stripes that we bear in our souls, that somebody else is going to be healed. When you tell them your story, I, I don't really know how you feel, but I know that a similar thing has happened to me, and this is how God brought me through. That's how you help heal someone else. This is the message of the cross. And as 
imitators of Christ, Paul is reminding us that this life of ministry is no joke. It is hard. Anybody know what I'm talking about besides me? And the things that we go through as we carry the treasure in these clay pots, say I'm a clay pot, the things we go through as we carry the treasure in these clay, clay pots have to leave us better and not bitter because we're going to go through some stuff. And God allows it. We're at a conference. I mean, we're having a joyous time. It's a wonderful move of God. And then a friend's mother dies, okay? So things do happen, but God wants us to protect the treasure that is within us. That uh, we have to purify, you know, the gold in our lives so that people will see a stark difference between you and the world, between me and the world. They've got to see that we're different. There's something different about us. Everybody goes through, saint and sinner. Nobody is exempt. But we all know the difference between saint and sinner going through is how we go through. You see, as keepers and carriers of the treasure, the, what's the treasure? As it would tell us in 2 Corinthians 4, the treasure is the life and the light and the glory of God that is within us. When the holy God came to live within us, he is that treasure. He is that light. He is that glory. We didn't have all of that on our own. So we must go through these thought, things that Paul speaks about in ways that bring no discredit to our ministry. We're all going to go through stuff. We treasure the ministry that God has given us. But while we're going through, we don't want to bring any discredit to the ministry that he has given us. In ways we don't want to bring any stumbling block to anyone. Because you know that there are some folk out there, they're just looking for a reason to label us as counterfeit. Oh, look at her. She's, she's not for real. So they don't have to do what they are supposed to do. They're looking for an excuse to not do what they're supposed to do. And, our, and in our living the cross life, Paul lets us know, as if we haven't found out already, that there are going to be some trials. These are the kinds of things that put marks on our lives for which there is no fade cream. And he lists nine of them. And the hope is that we are maturing in our faith. As we are maturing in our faith, we also develop those nine inner qualities. Did you see the two, the couplets as we went through the reading? Those nine inner qualities are what help us to counteract the trials that we experience in life. He lets us know that despite all that we do to behave ourselves as ministers of the gospel, to live the pure and holy life, there are nine pairs of paradoxes that challenge us. Paradoxes, things that contradict one another, things that are opposite of one another, that give us challenge. Now when we look up the nine, uh, the, the lineup of the nine trials, he has listed here, I recall in my own life that they present some rough waters on the sea of life, some powerful winds and storms across the landscape of my life. But I also recall that it is the will of God that we handle them with patience. I was driving on the road yesterday and uh, some things were happening and a tractor trailer pulled up ahead of me and on the back of it, it said patience. And I thought of Johnny Diaz in his song that says, breathe, just breathe. You're going to get there when you get there. And all will be well. You may remember that patience helps you and me deal with difficult circumstances difficult circumstances 
and long suffering helps you and me deal with difficult people. And though the Lord may not have sent the trials and afflictions, persecutions, and impositions into our lives, he certainly has allowed them. He allows them, I believe, because he's making us like him. That's why I believe he allows them. The scripture tells me that Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. It's not easy for us, and it's not easy for him because we don't always cooperate. We're not always pliable. We are not like putty in his hands, in the hand of the potter, the clay. But God is merciful and God is long suffering with you and with me and he, he keeps at it. He just keeps at us little by little. He keeps going on with every trial that we experience, with every joy, with each hardship, with each success, with each persecution and with each triumph. He makes us more and more like Jesus. You look at yourself today, you're more like Jesus than you were last year, five years ago. 10 years ago. Many of us here have either had trouble on the job or at home, at school, or at church. We have suffered with accusations and slander, confusions and misunderstandings. We have been distressed with losses, our own sickness or that of the loved one. We have been pushed into narrow spaces and hemmed in with the hardships of life. And some of us has been beaten physically and verbally. We may not have been in physical prison, but many of us have been placed behind the bars of oppression, discrimination, prejudice, racism, classism, sexism. You understand what I'm talking about here today? It's not one of those jump up and down, happy, happy, joy, joy messages, I know. Some of us have been hurt as a result of being in the midst of a riot. I don't know if you've ever been in a riot. I've been in the midst of a riot. And I don't even know how it happened. And we were coming out of school. I was in high school. We were coming out of a school and all of a sudden a riot broke out. But a riot, it, you may not have been in a riot on the streets, but you may have been in a riot on the job, in the community, or even in church. What kind of riot? A riot of being knocked down by angry words, a riot of being trampled by someone's ambition and clamoring to be first, a riot of ladder climbers who are stepping on you to get to the top, a riot of those who don't want to want the pastor anymore. There, I don't know if you've heard about it, there are some churches that we don't want that pastor anymore. And trying to push and shove him or her out. We've also had impositions of working hard above and beyond for people, whoever people may be for you. I said to one of my classes that I was teaching at the university and I said, I'm working harder than you. And that shouldn't be because you're the one in this class. I do the reading before I come to class. I'm prepared. I've got my PowerPoint up on the board. I'm ready to teach. And I'm waiting for dialogue from you, only to find you have not done the reading. I did give them this lecture, just as I'm saying it to you today. And I'm feeling like I'm working harder than you are. And that should not be. Although when I said it, I had a very soft tone. But it came out very loudly. So, you have these imp impositions. We've had sleepless nights, and we've gone hungry, just like the scripture is saying. That has happened to Paul and his friends. We've had those things happen to us. And in the end, we wonder, like Paul wondered, is there anyone around here appreciating what I'm going through to make life happen for others? That's what I was thinking when I was in class that day. I'm trying to make this happen for you. Are you appreciating it? And so, but someone said, uh, if you want to find gratitude, look in the dictionary. 
Well, like Paul, we don't want to have to look in the dictionary for gratitude. But with all these marks that we get while in the midst of the ministry, we have to remember that it is the adversary. You see, we tend to look at each other. But it is the adversary that is constantly sending attacks our way, not those around us. Those around us are not the ones that are sending attacks to us. It's the adversary who is sending attacks our way. It's not the people around us who put marks on us. Look beyond the surface. But I do believe it is God who allows the marks on us to show the areas in which we have already overcome. We look at that and say, I remember when such and such and so and so ha happened and I was... I could have been killed, but I wasn't. I overcame because of God. But the question is, where is your tipping point? Where is your tipping point? Where is the edge for us? How full does the glass have to get before it actually runs over? What is the last straw or the net last nerve for you? We hear people say, oh, they got on my last nerve. What is the last nerve for us? We have to be able to answer these questions for ourselves because in the midst of being under pressure, in the midst of being pressed down by the circumstances in life, in the midst of hardships and distresses and those things that just back us up in a corner, we have to be able to draw on something other than our own humanity and what we've got going for ourselves because that runs out. What you've got going for yourself, that runs out. I don't care how many titles you have before or after your name. There comes a time in the midst of everything that you are going through that you have to have already, before the thing hits us, to have already developed enough spiritual balance, enough spiritual muscle, enough spiritual strength that we're able to put on our armor and pull ourselves back up from the edge and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I remember my sister saying to me about another person, how, how can you deal with that person? The person was rough, would say mean things, would hurt your feelings at the drop of a hat, would just say anything to you. It was kind of like Dr. Eve would say to me when I would see him coming, I forgive them from afar off. That was a good lesson for me. Forgive them. And what I said to my sister, I have built up enough emotional muscle to be able to handle the weight of all of that that she brings with her because I love her. You can't just throw people away like they're an old dirty rag. <laughs> and when we get filled up to the top and we start running over, let it be with living water. <laughs> the Bible says out of your innermost being shall flow living water. Sometimes we want that water to be caustic so that it brings poison because we're so whatever the emotion is. Let it be living water flowing from our innermost being. Oh yes, one thing I know is that uh, what I'm saying is most certainly a tall order, especially when we're in the thick of it, we're in the midst of the situation and, and you know, do we remember these words that I'm speaking now? Do I remember these words that I'm speaking now? Sometimes we've got to kind of like grab our own selves by the collar and say, oh. So when we're in thick of it, it's, it's, it's definitely a tall order, but it can only be filled by the fullness of the Godhead within us. As we heard in the, uh, para, in the um, John 15 passage, that as we abide in the vine, that's the only way we're able to get, and be, get past and be strong against the attacks of the enemy. Remembering that it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can keep ourselves pure, in righteousness, remain understanding, patient, kind, and sincere. That we can show love, be truthful in speech. That's important because sometimes somebody says to you, well, well what's wrong? Nothing. 
Well, you seem a little, I'm all right. Being truthful in speech. I'm feeling a little sad because of, of what you said or what you did. Be truthful in speech. Lean on the power of God and keep the weapons God has given us in both hands. Weapons that defeat the enemy at every turn. Now, if our focus is on the nine pairs of paradoxes Paul gives us, it is not, it is not correct. Uh, if our focus is not correct as we're looking at them, we will not see the victory that we stand in. We'll just see the defeat. But know this, we're not marching to a victory. We're standing in a victory that's already won for us at Calvary when Jesus said it is finished. And if we focus on the insults and on the dishonor, we will not see the honor of how folks do welcome what God has placed in us. We miss it. Though some may malign us and give us an evil report, God always causes those good reports to overshadow the bad. There are those who would regard us as deceivers, imposters, Yet others know that you are authentic, know that we're genuine, know that we are true, know we're the real thing. And often we may encounter those who don't know us or acknowledge the ordination that God has placed upon our lives, but he sent us to those who do. See, that's the other side of the coin. When it looked like we were down for the count and folks thought it was over for us, God raised us up. You remember that, right? And when folk thought they had beat us down and we looked like they had killed us, just like with Paul, they left him for dead. <laughs> God is the one. He sustained his life within us. His life. And even in our sorrow, he causes us to rejoice. When we get nothing, when we've got nothing, we've still we still are going to work to make sure that somebody else has something. You know how that is. Well, I don't really have anything, but they have less than I do. And we're still going to make sure that somebody else has got something. Even if we possess nothing, we possess everything because we have the fullness of the Godhead living in us and every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So I want to read this to you from Isaiah 30, 21. 20 and 21, it says, And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or whenever you turn to the left. I thank God for that passage. Because no matter where it is that you're going in life, you may not always see the way. And you may kind of go off to the right or the left off course. But the thing that keeps me confident is that I know I'm going to hear that voice behind me say, Hey, this is the way. Walk ye in it. I don't have to worry about missing it. You don't have to worry about missing it. You don't have to stress over it. Is this the direction God wants me to do? Is this what God wants? You don't ever have to stress over it because as you keep on practicing your spiritual disciplines, in the midst of doing so, God is going to show you. No matter all the stuff that's going on and in, in the, the noise and the discordant sounds that the enemy creates all around you, in the midst of all that, you find yourself in favorable circumstances. Even in the midst of unfavorable circumstances, in the midst of emotional distress and, and, and you feel cramped and you feel like you're in a narrow place, you feel like you're all hemmed in that you have a mark on your life as a result of all these things. God is not going to give you any fade cream because fade cream can't touch this stuff. But one thing that you know what he is going to do, he's going to put somebody in your life who will be that teacher, who will help you and direct you and guide you and teach you and instruct you. Yes, he gave us the Holy Spirit, but he's also going to give us people. Now, like I said before, I don't 
really care how many titles that you have before or after your name. Everybody needs a teacher. We, we, don't, we don't get away from needing a teacher, somebody. And I, I saw something uh, that first seemed odd to me when I looked up the word teachers. And yeah, yes, it meant those who would help us to see signs, know the times, or discern the will of God, even in the midst of famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And, and in these days when pastors are marrying the same sex and remaining pastors in the church, uh, and it's okay with the people, and it's clearly a famine of the word in the land to me. But this word teachers also meant former rain and early rain. So it kind of takes you out into agriculture. Now the former rain, literally the darting rain, is from the middle of October into the middle of December. It fertilizes the otherwise barren land. And I believe that some of us have become barren not because we can't produce but because we have so many marks on us that we have given up the desire to produce in ways that God has called us to do. Kind of reminds you of the parable of the sower, doesn't it? And the thorns that choke out. Oh, I know you're not hearing me now, but God wants to fertilize your barren land and cause his favor to rest upon you. He wants to, you to be in a place where you can listen and hear his voice either directly or indirectly through someone or something tangible or intangible. <laughs> he wants you to hear his word with the intent toward obedience. You see, I often say that hearing for God means more than just my ability to pick up sound. It means hearing with the intent toward obedience because you will hear his voice when you begin to go off course. But you must obey what he says. Sometimes we're in the midst of something happening to us and, and we feel like doing this, but all of a sudden we hear his voice and it grips us and stops us. We're about to say something. You know, you said something that hurt me and I, I want to say something back to you, but he grips us and stops us. We have to obey in that moment. Sometimes the small impositions and distresses, distresses and persecutions cause us to lose direction and go off course. The devil puts a, a lot of voices and noise uh, around us to confuse us. So we don't know which way to go, what decision to make or who to talk to. I, I can't talk to this one. I can't talk to the other one. I don't know who to trust anymore. And God is doing stuff in our lives and the devil is interfering with what God is doing. And we're in so much turmoil that we don't know the difference between God and the devil. We think because these things are happening and, and, and it's driving me to the edge and I, I don't really know how to pull myself back from them. It must be the devil. It's God. But the devil will use that to interfere. He will use what God is doing to interfere with your life that, and interfere with my life to prevent us from really getting to the place of knowing what God truly is doing and how God is using us. So instead of binding the devil, we start rebuking the Lord. I have a friend who is a pastor. Her husband is a pastor also, and they pastor a church together in a Jewish community, and the devil has used the people in that community for years to torment and persecute the church because they don't want those Christians in their community. Now in the midst of this high level warfare, the husband makes a life choice that leads to a devastating decision. He has an affair with a woman in the church and just like the Lord said, if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. The husband pastor admitted to the, his wife pastor that he was not sorry for having done it. And somehow or another, 
Job's friends were resurrected and began criticizing the wife, telling her, you must have done something to cause your husband to sin against God and his own body. So here is my friend trying to endure the troubles, hardships, distresses, the infidelity that infidelity causes. She is trying to endure the verbal beatings, the imprisonment of guilt cast upon her, and the stampede as folk run to take their place on either side of the line drawn in the sand while she's still trying to keep someone from stumbling from any decision that she may make at this point. And after eight months of sitting down, the husband went back to his role as pastor, and there was still no reconciliation between him and his wife. I'm talking about being called by God and bringing no discredit to the ministry. Are you following me here? I know it's long, but I need you to stay with me a few more minutes. She wrote me an email and one of the things that she said to me is that I just want to sleep and never wake up. This thing has happened to her, this thing that has happened to her left an indelible mark on her life. But we who love her will not stand by and let it be a mark of defeat in her, her life, but a mark of victory. And in one of my conversations where I asked her who she had there, who, that, who she could trust, and she named only one person. And that person called me a couple days later, and I let her know it's time to move in like the muskox. Now, I don't know if you all are familiar with muskox. I've talked about muskox in this church before. It's a, 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 a kind of ox, and when the wolf comes, they kind of get around in a circle, and all of the ox are facing out. Musk, M-U-S-K, musk ox, and they're facing out all around in that circle. But in the center of the circle are their little ones, the ones who are vulnerable. And when the wolf comes, what happens is one of the musk ox leaves the circle to go out and fight the wolf. And the other musk ox close ranks to protect the little ones in the center, the, the vulnerable ones in the center of the circle. And when that musk ox gets tired of fighting the wolf, then he backs into the circle and another one goes out. So I said to her, and it happens until the wolf is brought down and everyone is safe. I said to her, you know how you, you probably heard, it's time to circle the wagons. It's time to circle the muskox. You may remember that when Jesus walked this earth, the people said and did things to him that left him wounded and bruised and assaulted, that they left marks on his body and on his soul, but he kept his focus and stayed on course, you see? All of these things come to distract us from what God has called us to do. And we have to stand firm and say no. You may remember that Jesus went to Calvary and those who crucified and killed him left marks on his body for which there is no fade cream. And he went down into the ground with those marks. But I'm here to tell you today that those marks could not keep him in the grave, as you already know. Those marks could not keep him from leading captivity captive. Those marks could not keep him from rising from the dead. They could not keep him from walking on the earth again. And those marks could not keep him from, saying, uh, uh, from saving you and me. They were there, but he didn't miss his mission. I realized a long time ago that we're going to get marks just because we are in ministry. You say, I'm in ministry. I'm going to get marks. It's not the ministry per se that leaves the marks, but it is the result of the ministry. 
As a roaring lion, the, the devil roams about seeking whom he may devour. And though God does not, does not allow him to devour us, he does allow him to bring the kind of attacks against our lives that leave marks that no fade cream can touch. The adversary is after the treasure within us. He is after the word that God has placed in us that will bring us to our destiny. The, the, the devil is after the word of God that he has placed in you, Maria and Bob. He is after that treasure and he will do anything to keep you from sharing that treasure with anyone. That goes for everyone in this room. That goes for you, Joe and Mary who have a dream in your heart of what God has told you to do. He will use everything and anything to keep you from that. But you will not let him. And we will circle the muskox to protect you from the enemy. Amen? He knows that we will need help in bringing to birth that which the enemy is trying to kill. God knows that. So we're not going to do it on our own. We're not going to bring these dreams to birth on our own. God is going to help us. He's going to send us midwives to help deliver the dream. And the marks that ministry leaves on us are Sharpie marks. You ever had a Sharpie? You ever try to get that off of something? Magic marker marks. Indelible ink marks. They don't come off. They don't fade. They are not removable. Fade cream can't touch this stuff I'm talking about. But we have to remember that it is not the people under our ministry. It is not the people around us. It's not the people that come in your, ha your home. It's not the people who will come to my father's house cafe. It is not those people. It is not the folk in our families or those who we thought were our friends. It's not the Judas in our lives, but it is God who allows these marks. Got complaints? I could tell you who to talk to. You see, marks identify who you are. I can tell you apart from me because of the marks on your life. Others are wondering how you got to where you are because they don't see the marks. They look at your life and they say, you know what? You should be doing this. You should be doing that. They make judgments about you, about what you ought to be doing, when you ought to be doing it, how you ought to be living your life. God is your judge. The Holy Ghost is the one who's leading and telling you what you are to do and when you are to do it. But God sees the marks and keeps taking you higher and higher because in spite of the marks you have, those inner qualities that cover those marks. You see those inner qualities in that scripture? That's what covers all of that up. Those inner qualities that say with, uh, that with those marks, God's grace is sufficient for you. Yeah, I've got it. I've got this pain. I've got this suffering. I've got this hardship. But you know what? God's grace is sufficient for me. And it is with that grace that I will go forward and do what he's called me to do. Those inner qualities say that with those marks, God's grace is sufficient. With those marks, God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. With those marks, we can run on and see what the end is going to be. With those marks, we can say, Lord, I'm running. Trying to make a hundred. 99 and a half won't do. Amen? Father, we thank you for this word. We hear you today, O oh God, with the intent of being obedient to you. These things are not always easy to hear, O oh Lord. They kind of put a frown on our brow and a furrow on our brow. But God, we know that when you're speaking to us, it is for our own good. I'm first partaker of this word, oh God, and I thank you for that. May we all partake of that which you have imparted to us today, Lord, that we may be more like you. And when you look upon the marks on our lives, you see the marks of ministry. 
and you've brought us up higher to a place where we understand that no matter what happens, we will bring no discredit to the ministry that you have given us. No dishonor to your name, which is above every name. So we thank you, Lord, for leading us. And we say, lead on, King Jesus. We're following. Amen.